This is how the book ends. This is how the lament ends. Unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. That's the way it ends for the lament. That's the way the weeping prophet ends lamentations. Unless you have utterly rejected us. Now, I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you ever felt like the weeping prophet? In the middle of suffering, in the middle of doubt. I know that some of you have because you responded that way on the survey. You, said, I, you simply said, I doubt God. I doubt his love for me. I doubt any joy that I can find in the gospel because of my suffering. When I was younger, I was surprised by suffering. And I I was in second grade. (laughs) Yeah, second graders can be surprised by suffering. But I had to have my tonsils removed. And if if you have children um, and and they've had their tonsils removed, you know what my parents did. You know what the doctors did. They, they, They got you books about the hospital. They read you books about the hospital, these colorful books with these kids who were receiving all these presents in the hospital. And they, you talked about the big day that you're going to have to go to the hospital and, and have the visit with the doctors and there's going to be a cool bed that goes up and down, up and down. You're going to have your own TV. Yes, your own TV. You're going to be able to watch movies all day. You're going to be able to read books if you want to all day. You don't have to do any schoolwork for a whole week. You're going to get ice cream after the, after the, after the surgery's over and you're just like, oh, I can't wait for the surgery, man. Right? This this is what you're taught before you go in. You better hold your second grader's ears at this point. You get candy. I remember there's a pile of presents in there for me. That's how I remember it. This is awesome. And then the surgery comes. And they strap you to the gurney and your mom is crying. Sign number one. They wheel you in, I remember it, they wheel you in, you're in the gown, and she's like, why are we crying? There's ice creams coming, mommy, ice cream for everybody as much as I want. And then you go in, they say, you're going to watch yourself on the TV, there's going to be a a TV, it's going to show your heartbeat, beep, beep, just so you get to see your heart on TV. I remember sitting, I can see it like it was yesterday, watching that green screen from the 1980s with that little beep on there. And, and I remember exactly how it looked, and I thought, that's not me. I'm like, look, you can see yourself on the screen. I thought, this is a lie. This whole thing's a lie. Then they put the mask on. Count backwards. And I counted backwards. Ten, nine. Then I woke up in the uh, recovery room, there's blood around my mouth and there's a dude in an entire body cast right next to me where all you saw was his eyes. I'm talking mummy. Leg up, arms up. I think he even said boo. Boo. I saw that guy and I started to scream. Tonsils had just come out and I started screaming. I want my mommy. I don't know why I wanted her. She had betrayed me. I wanted my, and I started screaming and the nurses come over and like, if you don't settle down, Daniel, if you don't settle down, we're going to take you out of here. Yes, that's what I want. I want out. And then they have the piles of ice cream. You want ice cream and you try to eat the ice cream and you can't eat the ice cream. And I looked at my mom and dad and I was like, you lied. And why did I think that? Why did I, I didn't say that to them. I just clung to them and cried. But I had the blood around my mouth, it's crusted on me, and I thought, you, I've been betrayed. That is how we feel, I think, when we suffer. No one expects to suffer. No one expects to get a phone call. No one expects to go to the doctor and be told, you have six months to live. No one expects that. Christians don't expect it because we have been brought up in churches where we've been taught that if you come to know Jesus, everything's going to be all right. And Jesus doesn't promise that. And Jesus says you're going to face trials of many, many kinds. Don't be surprised by suffering. And yet we're constantly surprised by it. And we, we, like the weeping prophets, say, unless you utterly have rejected us. Restore me. Unless you are exceedingly, are you exceedingly angry with me? The shock of suffering produces waves of doubt in God, just in the same way that I doubted my parents after I had my tonsils removed. In a much greater way, we doubt God. 
We doubt God when we are surprised, when we wake up in the recovery room and we think, this is real. I remember the day after I woke up after Mark had died and we had gone through the night at the hospital and I woke up and I took my first step out of the bed and I, I remember it perfectly. I thought, this is real. This is reality. And then I walked out to our backyard volleyball court and it was a hot 105 degree July day and I thought, this is reality. We're never going to play together again. This is the real deal. And you ask, have you utterly rejected us? And there's some serious doubt. Perhaps there's no more fertile soil for doubt, for the seeds of doubt, than suffering. And why is that? Because doubt can be the uncertainty about God, about his, his attributes, and it, it's when we feel isolated from him. Paul Bunyan talks about this. He writes about this in the Pilgrim's Progress when he talks about Christian who's on a journey to see the celestial city. And he's on this long journey with a burden on his back and he is captured by the giant despair. For those of you who've read it, you know what I'm talking about. And giant despair locks him up in the doubting castle. I love Paul Bunyan because he uses allegory but not quite. (laughs) I mean, he just tells you exactly what he's thinking. Giant despair locks him up in, in, in Doubting Castle and he starves Christian. It's a perfect picture of suffering. He starves him and he's trying to convince Christian to kill himself. There's no way out. In suffering, you're in Doubting Castle. You're, you're there with giant despair and then Christian realizes, I have a key. I forgot about this key called promise. That's what I think we find in the scriptures. That God has not abandoned us. That we can rely on his promises even in suffering. That God, in suffering, is drawing us into deeper waters of faith in Jesus Christ. 